Okay, we're starting this morning with our schools panel. This morning's theme is successes that break down barriers. And as you're all aware now, there have been some serious changes in the National School Lunch Program. We use that term, and of course it includes breakfasts and snacks and all that sort of thing over the last couple of years. And some of these uh, changes have received widespread publicity as real bumps in the road, and the kids won't eat this, and the schools can't do this, and oh, it's the end of the world. And you know, it's that terrible problem that we always have that there is never a headline that says, people had a good day and went to sleep happy. That doesn't make the headlines. But out there are a lot of really good dedicated schools and the manufacturers working with them who are really making this happen and bringing an extra level of much better nutrition to our kids. And we wanted to tell that positive story in our panel this morning. So we started looking around to say, how has change gone down in these schools? We figured, okay, you know, we'll have to look around the country and find somebody who can really exemplify the good things that are happening in schools. We didn't get much farther than 10 miles away. We talked to the Boston Public Schools and the Cambridge Public Schools and said, you don't have to look very far to find schools that are finding, having a great job of, of implementing these. So we are really proud to have with us this morning Melissa Honeywood, Director of Food and Nutrition Services for the Cambridge Public Schools on the far end of our panel. Samantha Weiss Kimball, Supervisor of Menu Planning and Special Diets for the Boston Public Schools. And Colleen Donnelly, who is Corporate Chef K-12 Segment for In Harvest, a whole grain supplier. Um, you kind of get the idea of what our first two panelists do because they are in the schools, although they'll tell you some things maybe you didn't know about what they do. What Colleen does, she lives her life on the road traveling from one school district to the next to help them learn how to cook whole grains in delicious ways. And that's part of, uh, of one reason why we're here and why we invite our manufacturing partners here. You can't just put the product out there on the shelf and say, okay, you figure the rest of it out. The manufacturers have the most success are those who go that extra step an extra mile, really, to say, hey, let me make it easy for you. Let me show you how to make these things delicious. So that's a great combination. So let's give a, a warm welcome to all three of these experts on the subject of whole grains in schools. OK, I guess that's me. Um, one of the things, we're going we're gonna to just sort of go through some um, short presentations and then open up for questions. I'm going to ask some questions and then you guys can ask some questions. But one of the things that um, I just want to open with, um, as S Cynthia said, I, I travel around the country and I talk to school districts and I just try to find solutions for them because we're facing these, well, we're here. We have these guidelines in place and um, people are struggling and people are doing really well. And one of the things that I, that I try to determine going into a district is their readiness factor. And some people, we were discussing at breakfast how, how far along a district um, can be before the regulations take place. Um, some people have already done a lot of their homework. Some people are kind of going, oh, wow, it's July 2014. Now we have to have all of our, all of our grains be um, whole grain rich. Um, so, so they're fa they they sometimes they're they they panic. Um, but then you have the people who uh, I I work with a district in California who said um, called me and said, "Do you have black rice?" I said, "Wait, black rice?" She said, "Yeah, I want to get as far away from brown rice or white rice as I possibly can. <laughs> I want black rice." And I was like, "You are the most ready person I've ever met." And then there's everything in between. There are the people who have to switch over to brown rice and, and, and are worried about it. But so we offer solutions. I offer solutions as a manufacturer. I offer ideas. I offer um, staff trainings. I go in and I do tastings with kids. I talk to people. Um, and I, I think I'm just going to start off with that and just say that, that every single district in the country is different. No two are alike. Some only have ovens. Some have state-of-the-art kitchens. Some have central kitchen look um, models. Some are doing a heat and serve on site in a warmer, and, and it's up to us as the manufacturer to figure out how they can work with our products. So I'm going to turn it over, and, and you guys can just start talking school talk. Uh, again, my name is Melissa Honeywood. I am the director of food and nutrition services for Cambridge Public Schools. 
And what we're going to talk about today is just give you guys a brief overview of what it is that we do, because chances are for most of you, your knowledge of school meals is from when you were in school and had meals. So we're going to take you back a few years and um, show you what it's like from the administrative end and how we do what we do and the perception of what school food is versus the reality of our everyday jobs. Uh, then uh, both Sam and I will go into the specifics of um, our individual districts, as Colleen mentioned, every district is different um, as far as what their infrastructure is and, that, and how that impacts what they do. And then we'll have time for questions at the end. Uh, so just to jump right into it, this is the perception of um, uh, school food. Uh, you imagine customer service with folks like Brenda here, the mean lady that has just peddling perfectly rounded uh, mashed potatoes, you got Chris Farley's Lunch Lady Land, and my favorite, Lunch Lady Dora from The Simpsons. <laughs> and this is compliments of Google search. Like, I did not have to dig far to get this. <laughs> then there's also the food. People imagine that everything is just greasy and fried, that we're serving Rice Krispies treats with abandon, and that <laughs> it's just all grains all the time that are high in sugar and um, really just piling on all the different, oh, there's Dora again, and just random government food that we're putting <laughs> into the school meals. This is what people think that we do, and they think because of that that we are the ones who are contributing to childhood obesity, because when we think of students and children, we associate them with school. So obviously, these young children who are students that go to school, it is the school meals that are making them overweight. Here's the reality of school food. We are the most highly regulated food industry in the world. I come from private industry. I went to culinary school. I have over 10 years of culinary experience. When your end game is profit, it's very easy to do business. Add more butter, add more fat, add more salt. It's very easy to sell things. That's not our goal in school nutrition. Uh, we are as I said, the most highly regulated food industry because we have the federal government telling us what we can serve and how we can serve it. Also, on top of that, we are doing high volume food production. It's like odor owning a catering business at several sites, serving thousands of people the same meal made different ways for different diets at the same time for 180 days out of the year. Um, and we also uh, have very low fixed budgets with very high expectations. No one wants to be proud of serving terrible food, especially to children. We have very high standards set for ourselves and a fixed budget for which to do it with because we rely on federal reimbursement. Now, I'm going to take you back to before the new child nutrition standards were in place. Um, just giving you a basic overview of how the USDA had the regulations set for school nutrition. Previous to the new regulations, uh, there were two different ways that a school district could choose to have their food analysis done by the state, by auditors. They could say, I am running a food-based operation, which meant that they had to meet, they had to play food Tetris. They got to figure out how many grains, how many meats, how much milk and vegetable, fruits and vegetables were served. Um, or you could do a nutrient analysis based uh, system where as long as you met the nutrition, the very basic nutrition standards that were set out, you could serve whatever you wanted, which led manufacturers to make things like super donuts. As long as it was enriched with vitamin A, vitamin C, and it had a minimum amount of carbs, then they could serve that and it was okay. You could serve a super donut every day and you were totally within your rights. Then you also had the same department, the USDA, who makes the food guide pyramid, also makes the child nutrition food guide standards. And they determined that instead of fruits and vegetables being two different things for child nutrition, fruits and vegetables were the same thing. So an apple equaled celery sticks, equaled a banana, equaled tomato sauce, equaled french fries. Those were all part of the same group. And you could serve any one of those as long as you served a certain amount over the course of the day and the week, you were golden. So if you served french fries every single day, you were serving a fruit or vegetable every single day. And then on top of that, 
um, and specifically uh, why we're here, whole grains, they weren't really enforced. Uh, on the caro meter, you can see that um, they were encouraged, <laughs> but they were not actually required. So they're like, meh, you can do whole grains if you want, but there was no, there was, there was no carrot or stick um, when it came to offering whole grains. Um, and so now what we have are, it is now food-based standard only. We're all speaking in food because we serve food to children. Let's talk about food. And they've modified it. So now, hey, fruits and vegetables are actually different. And guess what? Some vegetables are more nutritiously dense than others. And all whole grains now must be whole grain rich. And Sam is going to talk about the specific standards and how that applies to whole grains with us today. All right, so um, we're going to focus specifically on the regulations for grains, because that's why we're all here. But um, there's a breakdown of kind of all the components um, available through the USDA or from some other sources. But specifically looking at the grains, so if we look at grains for breakfast, you have things like cereal and oatmeal, muffins, bagels. But also for breakfast, if we look at the components that we have to serve, we have to serve a grain, we have to serve a milk, and we have to serve a cup of fruit. There is no meat in there. So what the USDA has said is at this time, if you are serving something like a turkey sausage or eggs, you can count that towards your grain. So a meat is now considered a grain for breakfast. Um, <laughs> So it's not very clear. Um, with that being said, if we are serving eggs or a turkey sausage, we do have to serve a grain, a true grain, um, to counter it. Um, but if we look at the regulations for grains every day for K-8, um, or actually through K-12, we have to serve at least one ounce equivalent. And I'll get into the equivalent part of it in a, in a few slides of grain. But over the course of the week, we have to meet the minimum requirements for K through five, at least seven um, ounce equivalents throughout the course of the week, at least eight, and at least nine for, for 912. Um, so this is possible to have a K-12 menu because they removed the, they used to have minimums as well as maximums, and they found that districts were really um, squished, really, it was really tight to meet all of the requirements as well as meet the calorie limit, so you were forced to add things that we like to call calorie packets or calorie boosters of pudding and that sort of thing, things that weren't gonna count towards your grains so that way you had your limits throughout the week. And they kind of got rid of that, um, saying that you can serve as many grains as you want um, as long as you're serving the minimum. So you can make it work with a K-12 menu, which is what we have in Boston. So then if we look at lunch, um, lunch is similar. Um, except for it's a true grain. So you have to serve at least one ounce equivalent and it is only grain options are, are considered a grain for lunch. Um, so for K-8, you have to serve one ounce equivalent and for 9-12, you have to serve two ounce equivalents over the course of, for each lunch service. Um, and then there's at least eight ounces for K-8 over the course of the week. So on most days, you have to serve at least two ounce equivalents. And then for 9-12, you have to serve the two ounces every day. Um, so you have a minimum of 10. So um, the way we calculate that ounce equivalent, because it's not just a true ounce, the USDA has said that 51% of our grains have to be whole grain rich. Um, and in order to calculate how much grains you have, you can calculate it two ways. So I've highlighted it in red. So if you look at that, one slice of weight is 0.9 ounces. So you can either calculate it by saying, it, we'll look at the bottom one first, um, by saying 0.9 ounces divided by one ounce, it equals 0.9 ounces. Well, in order to be an ounce equivalent, you have to have that, that one. So we would round down, so it would be 0.75 ounce equivalent. So that doesn't even give me an ounce equivalent. But with that same slice of bread, if I look at the gram weight, so if the gram weight is 17 grams, and then I look at the box all the way to the end, 17 grams divided by 16 grams per the ounce, I'm over that one ounce equivalent. So the same slice of bread can be calculated two different ways. So it's not a black and white easy calculation. Um, so this is something that 
as school nutrition folks, we have to do this with our products, or as manufacturers, if you provide us with this information, it makes our, our job really easier because this takes a lot of time for us to be able to do with every single grain product. So also, the other way of calculating it is the USDA has come up, and I know this is really small font, but this is actually, it's double-sided. Um, and it goes all the way up through I, and it's that ounce equivalent um, chart that the USDA has put out to say, if you're serving a certain amount of muffin, this is how much is you actually need to serve in order to equal one ounce equivalent or two ounce equivalent. So this is kind of a chart to help us, um, but also, as you can see, the font's really small. It's a lot to go through. And now to give you some specifics about our district. So we've given you the overview of this is what the federal government expects every single school to do. And we're gonna give you some information about our individual school districts, just to bring it home. So in Cambridge, we have 13 kitchens and over 6,000 students. Um, and about 45% of our students qualify for free and reduced price meals, which means that they are, their family income brings them within a certain percentage of the national poverty line that the federal government agrees to reimburse us for the cost of serving that meal to that child. And this number varies greatly when you go from district to district. For Cambridge, we're around 45%. And some of the assets that we have in district that are unique to us um, are as follows. We have fully equipped kitchens, and that is really helpful because I know that my staff are able to produce the recipes that I have written. Um, and because we have increased cooking capabilities, I know that they're able to make the products that I've set out for them. We also partner with our local health department to um, do some of the nutrition education that I don't have time to do because I'm looking at that silly double-sided sheet trying to figure out my grain equivalents. And so I have a partnership with them to uh, really go out and speak with the students and have them understand what healthy eating is. Um, and I am very fortunate that uh, I've been with Cambridge for three years, but 10 years before I even arrived, the health department was working with the school district to introduce whole grains to students and to really get them on track to understanding what health and eating consists of. So that way I didn't have to make a complete tide change when I arrived. They were already primed and knew what healthy eating was. They had reflections um, for it in their everyday lives. I also have, each of my elementary schools has a garden, so they are right now growing wheat in their garden to see what winter rye looks like compared to other grains, and they have that association in their hands, and it's built into their curriculum. That makes my life much easier when I talk about whole grains. Um, and as you'll see from some of the photos as we've been going through, these are all different menu items that I currently serve that involve whole grains, whether it's whole grain pita with our Greek salad, or the whole grain spaghetti that we serve, the whole grain bread for our grilled cheese, um, our whole grain items for breakfast. Um, this is what school lunch looks like today. All right, and in Boston, we're slightly different than Cambridge. So we have um, a 128 schools. We serve over 57,000, actually, I think this year it's up to 58,000 students that we're feeding every day. Um, out of those 58,000, um, enough qualify, how Melissa said that 45%, we have it enough that qualify for free um, meals that every student in our district, as long as they are taking a reimbursable meal, is eating for free. Um, and I put that caveat in there, as long as they're taking a reimbursable meal. So if the child is just taking milk, that is not a reimbursable meal. They have to take at least three components for lunch, one of which is a fruit or a vegetable. Um, so we've seen actually a, a huge increase um, in the number of meals we're serving um, from last year when we started the program to the previous year. Um, so out of those, we also serve 93 um, after-school meal programs, which is that CACFP, because it's a different guidelines than the ones I previously showed you. Um, 
And we have two different operations in Boston. We have 44 full prep kitchens, meaning they're getting everything, they're preparing it all on site, as well as we have 84 satellite schools. Being Boston and being um, such an old city, we have a lot of kitchens that were, or a lot of schools that were built before kitchens were put into schools. Kids went home for lunch. Um, and we're still using those same buildings. And so we now have to makeshift kitchens. So we have kitchens in closets and kitchens in gymnasiums where the lunch ladies are dodging balls being thrown at them. Um, <laughs> or we have little makeshift kitchens that we come up with. So these are um, what Colleen mentioned, our heat and serve. So we contract the meals um, out to a country, or to a contract, not to a country, to a contractor. Um, and the contractor um, prepares it at their facility. It's all prepared fresh, and then it's delivered to our schools. And it um, is served in a tray, and they just heat it up at the sites. Um, because these schools don't even have a prep sink. They're unable to wash any utensils. That's how, um, that's how these schools, th for equipment purposes. Uh, we have 31 fresh fruits and vegetable program sites. Um, so that is a separate program um, where they're able to provide a snack uh, three to four days a week, uh, separate from the National School Lunch Program. Um, and I already mentioned the community eligibility. Um, so here is a full prep kitchen. Um, I love showing these pictures because even in our full prep kitchens, um, there is a wide variety of what the equipment looks like. So this is Orchard Garden. This is one of our um, pretty equipped kitchens. Um, so here is, you can see a lot of refrigeration. She has four ovens. And, oh, I went, okay, so she has four ovens and just tons of other um, areas. So out of this kitchen, she's serving 552 breakfast on average last year or this year, and 783 lunches. So she's producing a whole lot of meals on there, and uh, the manager, Kathy, is, is definitely one of our champions. Um, so then we have the Henderson Inclusion Upper School. Um, so this is also a full prep kitchen. As you can see, it looks very different. This is their entire kitchen. Um, that is her one oven she has. And she, this is Heidi's school. Um, Heidi is also a, a very strong manager. She serves 117 breakfasts this year on average and um, about 259 lunches out of this one kitchen. So even amongst our full prep kitchens, the ones that I'm specifically writing the recipes for that they're producing on site, there is a huge variability amongst our full service kitchens. So you have to kind of work with your least common denominator, which is, one of the schools like this school, um, to make sure that you're serving, if you have pizza day, that you're not serving something that also needs to go in the oven because they only have one oven. So for instance, our vegetable on our pizza day is a sweet corn because it can be cooked on the stove. And so that way she has enough room to produce pizza. Um, and as, oh, that's her, that's her stove, um, and then the last kitchen is the Perry School, and a Perry School is actually one of our satellite kitchens, so one of our heat and serve operations. Um, so that is their actual cafeteria, and that is her refrigeration units, and that is her oven. So she is one where she's getting meals delivered every single day, and she's still serving about 100 breakfast out of there and about 150 lunch. So still a substantial amount of meals with the little bit of equipment. So we kind of have to, as we're thinking about products and thinking about our operations, we have to think about what is our equipment um, and what is the means that our staff can actually accomplish. And just to wrap things up, because I assume that most of you guys, your head is spinning right now, trying to wrap your head around what it is that school nutrition encapsulates, because as I said, for me, for somebody who came from private industry and then switched to, color, uh, switched to child nutrition, it was very daunting. But let me show you why we do this. So this, previous to coming to Cambridge, I used to work for Baltimore City Public Schools and we were fortunate enough where we were able to make a 33 acre organic farm that we used as a teaching and experiential learning site. From you see in this panel, there's a gentleman wearing a white polo shirt. 
in his hand, he is inspecting some baby mustard greens, some microgreens. For those of you who have tried microgreens that are mustard greens, you'll know that they have a little bit of a peppery bite to them. Like there's, there's a lot that goes on in there. And so when you try, this is the slide of him trying, actually tasting the mustard greens, you can see that his eyes are coming straight out of his face. He is, this, his mind is blown. He has tried something that he helped grow, that he helped harvest with his peers. And as skeptical as he seemed in the first panel, he tried it. But the most important slide, the most important image that I can show you is this one, is that he goes back again. <laughs> he is enthusiastic and he tries it again. And that is a lesson that you cannot teach in a book. This is why we do what we do, because we are trying to broaden the taste experiences for children today so that way they can grow up and be healthier adults tomorrow. Nobody does what we do for the money, for the glory. We do it because we're passionate about children and we want them to grow into healthy adults. And so we are here and asking for your help and asking to, for you to help us brainstorm how we can improve this system together. Thank you. Well said. Um, I, I want to ask, start asking a couple of questions. Um, and and we, as I mentioned, the readiness factor, I, uh, I, I do sell some entire grains to schools instead of just, um, just um, pizza crust and you know, whole grain breads and, and hamburger and hot dog buns, et cetera. And I wanted to ask you both, um, do, you, do you serve any whole grains such as quinoa, barley, um, wheat berries, any entire grains. If not, um, what are some of the obstacles to doing that? Is it price? Is it staffing? Is it kids? Um, and what would it take for y your individual situations to, you know, to, to be able to get you to that place where you could? Uh, in Cambridge, we do serve things like wheat berries and quinoa, albeit sparingly. Um, one thing that we didn't exactly highlight in our presentation was uh, exactly how much our fixed income is when we get reimbursed for a student who qualifies for a free meal. Right now, the federal reimbursement is $2.98 for every meal that's designated as free. Now, that's not $2.98 to spend on food, that is our entire reimbursement. So that goes into my staffing, which includes their labor and benefits. That includes any equipment I wanna buy or repair. That includes the plates that I have to serve my food on. And when you get down to it, you really only have about like a dollar and 10 cents or a dollar and 25 cents to spend on the actual food. So when I'm trying to figure out what I can serve, um, you really have to, be very mindful of when you're serving a more expensive whole grain product during the week because you're gonna have to offset that with uh, items that are more affordable. Um, we are fortunate in Cambridge that I have um, a very strong uh, culinarily trained staff at uh, my high school, so we offer those whole grains a little bit more frequently than we would at my elementary schools, which have employees who are really only there for three hours a day and don't have the adequate training. So. Um, it's just a matter of accepting a certain amount of risk to introduce a new type of product mm -hmm. and put it in the hands of folks who are trained to make it properly um, and serve it to students who will be more open to the idea rather than buying a very expensive grain and then serving it to a large amount of students who are just feeding it to the trash cans. Can you give us some examples of um, how they're prepared, the grains, salads, pilafs? Mostly cold salads for our wheat berries. Um, we do have, yeah, and I think our quinoa is also a cold salad, or we'll do like uh, an, an Israeli vegetable and grain salad that could be served warm or cold with different vegetables thrown in it. Yeah. And you only, how many high schools do you have? We have one high school. So <laughs> again, this is very different um, from other districts. Um, as I said, I used to come from Baltimore, which we had 84,000 students at 204 schools, um, which is very similar to the environment that Sam has to work in. 
Um, so for us, um, we're always trying out new things. We've developed a recipe protocol um, where we are trying it out in the test kitchen first to kind of get the flavor profile, making sure the components work out. And then because Boston is so diverse and different sectors of the city have a very different um, population, um, we are trying out recipes um, after the point of service, so it's not on the line, to try to see if the flavor profile works. Um, and for us, we currently, um, in our special diets, we do have a quinoa that we offer, but other than that, we haven't um, gone towards um, introducing new grains, um, but it's something that we're open to. It's just making sure that with the diversity of our district exactly um, what Melissa said is you don't want it to end up in the trash and if they're not trying the product, if they've never seen a product before, it's really that education piece and getting everybody on board as well as making sure that it's not a product that they've never seen before. Making sure that they're seeing it at home or when they're going out to eat or those type of things um, before it's really, um, it's something that we would use as potentially an education tool but it wouldn't be something that we could probably work onto our menu every day until kind of the public moves more towards some of those items where the kids are more used to some of those products. What can we as manufacturers do to facilitate the things that you're talking about? Is it, do we need to provide marketing tools? Do we need to provide the staff training? Is it us coming in and helping you with the, um, with kids doing, doing samplings? Um, product formulation statements we can talk about a lot to make your life a little bit easier. Just how, how can any manufacturer in this audience right now make your life easier? Well, one thing uh, I will touch on just uh, perception wise, uh, what would make my life easier and kind of what Sam touched on is if healthy food was the expectation in private industry for my kids to be served exclusively whole grain products and then go to their local bodega, their local restaurant, um, just be in their neighborhood where that is not accessible makes my job much harder because there's no reinforcement outside of the school day. And so uh, I am seen as the exception as opposed to common practice. And so really working with private industry and with um, consumer products to make that reflect the healthier food that we should all be eating. We don't have these standards for children because we just think that that is better for them. It's better for all of us. We need to be responsible adults and mirror the healthy eating habits that we are trying to instill in our youth. That was nicely said. Um, <laughs> I would also say, um, going to specifically the tools that we need, um, is the formulation statements, I know that they're time consuming, um, but they make our lives so much easier because we still have to look, use that to calculate it, but that's one less step that we then have to go to our broker or go to our distributor or contact you all to say, we need this information because that's now three or four different emails that we have to send, which ultimately takes away from potentially trying out new grains in our schools or doing some other things. Um, the other thing is, is staff training. Um, one of the things that I did when I came to Boston last year is we had spaghetti on our menu. And it was really hard for our staff to scoop it up and get the proper scoop size. So we played around with products and we now use a penne and a rotini instead of spaghetti, which is way easier to scoop out. And we tried it out with our staff. Um, but it's kind of figuring that out and being able to have um, you all, which you guys know your products, to come into our schools and train our staff. We did a staff training and it was the most successful day, I think, since I've been there. Because the staff, it, they, got, they felt this Iron Chef competition come on, they had this pantry to use from, and they got to create a food using whole grains. Um, and it was featured on our menu and they got pretty awards and um, they were highlighted. And for once they felt like this is something that that they can do, um, and this is something that they're feeling special. So for us, that's huge for us because you can only put things on your menu when your staff is trained. So if you're putting out a wheat berry, I don't think my staff at this point really know what a wheat berry is, some of them, or how to prepare it. So if we're gonna put wheat berries on, I have to train all of my staff. And yeah, I, I like wheat berries myself, 
but you guys know that product a lot better than I do. So you guys can come in and really show us specifically how to use it within the contents of what our kitchens. I mean, you saw what our kitchens are. What can we actually um, utilize with our kitchens that we have? Um, we're going to open up the floor to questions in just a second. I want to. This is a really huge question, um, and I know that we up here have a lot of opinions about this. But I want to. If you could both just give me very succinctly your view on the following. There is a concerted effort being made by the School Nutrition Association to have Congress roll back some of the new regulations that have just been put in place, in spite of the many success stories we are seeing in districts across the country. Where are you on this? I am with the position of the past 19 School Nutrition Association presidents who who brought forward the new standards, who worked with the USDA, who worked with federal officials to agree that this is the correct way to move forward, that we are doing a disservice and we are not being responsible if we are not addressing the nutrition of our children. I feel like that instead of focusing on what the, uh, how we cannot do something, let's focus on what is possible, what obstacles need to change. I feel like the fact that I have to explain the perception versus the reality of school food, that I have to blow your minds with all the nitty gritty details, that we have to be registered dietitians to even consider making a menu for a child, that just demonstrates that the system that we have is very complicated. We all have the same goal of feeding children healthy food. Let's figure out a way to do it that is financially sustainable, responsible to the youth that we serve, while also being a partnership between private industry and what we want our, our youth to see. We all have, we all know children, we all want our population to grow into healthy adults. Let's do it together and let's figure out a way to do it either within this system or come up with a new system to make it work. Um. I also um, take the stance with the past SNA, excuse me, SNA presidents. Um, with Boston specifically, we've been doing the regulations. For us, Whole Grains have kind of been a part of it. So when we had to make 51% of all of our grains whole grain, it was something where we had like one product that wasn't meeting it already. So it's something that is already kind of in the past. It's something that's now part of our staff. It's part of our system as well as so many other districts throughout the, the country. It's already part of us. There are a few districts that definitely are being very vocal about trying to reverse back the standards. But if you think about it, right now it's such an exciting time for school nutrition. There's people focusing on getting hormone and antibiotic free chicken in schools and doing more local procurement and coming up with compostable ideas and all of these things that we're light years ahead of that. We've said, okay, we can deal with the regulations. Now let's focus on all of the other issues that, that we can do to only improve school food and improve the health of, of our nation's youth. Um, so that's kind of where I stand. I apologize. I, I have a more succinct way of, of putting <laughs> what I want to say. If I could go back to those three slides where you could see the student experiencing something new. If we don't give kids an opportunity to try new healthy things, they will never try new healthy things. If you don't give them a chance to experience that, then that's a fault on us. It's not a fault on the kids because we never gave them the benefit of the doubt. We never gave them a chance to try something new. We are deciding for them that it's too difficult. We are deciding for them that they won't like it. Give them a chance. You will see the changes in the students. Amen. <laughs> any questions? He said, but if there are any pressing questions from the audience, they've covered so much territory here. They may have answered them already, but if there's any uh, and we only just br the brush the surface on what the true regulations are. <laughs> yeah. yeah, to the microphone, please, if you have a question. I was just curious if you guys also manage what goes into the vending machines in schools or if it's strictly the cafeterias. So with vending machines, <laughs> there is new regulation that um, 
that covers meals sold outside of breakfast and lunch, the school nutrition um, program that we run. But here's a fun fact. Most of the time, the food nutrition department does not have the contract with the vending machine company. Here's an even more fun fact. During audits, having a school abide by their wellness policy um, is part of the audit on the school nutrition department. So there is no carrot for following your school's wellness policy. And the only stick for not following the wellness policy by offering junk food and vending machines, the only department that gets punished is the <laughs> school nutrition department. We get disallowed meals. We lose reimbursement because a principal wants to hold the popsicle stale, sale or because they want to offer uh, vending machines all day, every day, um, even during meal periods. So we become the de facto food police, even though it should be a culture-wide change in the school. And we, like I said, we may not even have the contract for that vending machine, but we are penalized for being present. And we work very closely with our uh, health and wellness department. We actually share an office with them. So Boston, has, there's the new regulations that come out. Um, the city of Boston has their own regulations, and then the state has their own regulations, and then the district has their own regulations. That's a whole lot of regulations that I have to manage. Um, so um, we work very closely with the health and wellness department, but it is, I have my staff that are pretty much policing my schools, calling me up saying, hey Sam, can I go out there and just lay it in them that they're having, they're selling pizza out there, or they're selling hot dogs, or they're doing, they're having an ice cream sale, um, because the principals really have no incentive to stop it. Um, there's nothing really coming down on them except for with kind of this wellness policy that we have um, where they have to submit their reports every year, but the system definitely needs to be worked out more. Wow, a big round of applause for our school's panel. And let me emphasize that point where they said they've only touched the surface of the regulations they have to deal with. So. Um, we're in awe of how we managed to put those great meals on the table in the midst of all that. Thank you.